All right, so now let's talk about blood transfusion and what the role of the nurse is in this procedure. So let's start by talking about what's the big deal. Why do we care so much about blood transfusion? Why are we so worried? Well, that's because there's a lot of possibility of complications and reactions that can happen with these blood transfusions. So let's talk about kind of the step-by-step -step process. You know, as a nurse, my job is pretty much to protect for the safety of the patient. And I am that last barrier between them and a blood transfusion reaction or a serious complication. I need to make sure I have the right patient, right supplies, and the right blood product for that patient. So what comes first? First, I need to check my labs and, uh, sorry, check my order to make sure that I have it, or like, you know, I'm looking to see that the doctor ordered this. Um, and then also my labs. And like I mentioned in my other PowerPoint about anemia, um, that I want to look at the hemoglobin. I want to see what their hemoglobin is, because that's a lot of what's going to tell me about, um, you know, um, kind of why we're giving this. I want to see where they're starting, so I know maybe what our goal might be. Um, then, of course, the doctor is going to need to get consent um, for the blood. So no one can receive blood without their consent, because this is a, um, you know, as much as the patient may very much need the blood um, physiologically it is their choice and some religions do not accept blood products so we always need to get consent um, then I need to gather supplies so that the supplies that I, the basic supplies that I'm going to need are Y tubing which is a special tubing it literally looks like a Y and there's um, in one um, that one of the spikes I put the blood product and the other spike I put um, normal saline normal saline is the only fluid that's compatible with blood products so I need to make sure to grab that I can't grab any other type of fluid I also need to make sure the patient has IV access so it used to be thought that they had to have this really huge IV um, in order to give blood products but actually it's okay okay if it's a smaller one you know I kind of make the joke that you know think about if a patient came into the emergency room and they needed a blood product but they had really bad blood vessels like we're not going to just sit there and be like hey you need blood but yeah you know we can't get a big IV in you so too bad like no we can give it through a small um, you know IV it's preferred that it's a bigger size um, but as long as we're not you know doing um, uh, what do you call what we call like a, a mass transfuser or like a pressurized machine pushing it into that IV it's okay for it to be any size. Um, so we also need to have a vital sign machine because we're going to need to do frequent monitoring. So someone's going to go then to the blood bank after you get consent, get your supplies. Someone's going to go to the blood bank and go pick up your blood. They're going to do a double check down there to see that your blood is the right blood and right patient. Um, but you're going to have another double check to do, which we'll talk about in a second. So once the blood leaves the blood bank, you have 30 minutes to get the infusion started. This doesn't mean that it has to be done in 30 minutes. What it means is that that blood that's in that bag needs to be infusing into that patient or, you know, in their IV. You, know, you can see it all the way going into them within 30 minutes from when that blood leaves leaves the bank. We don't put it back in the fridge. We don't um, have, sit it out for a while, you know, thaw it out or anything like that. This blood needs to get in the patient within 30 minutes. It needs to start infusing within 30 minutes of leaving the blood bank. Otherwise, um, these, the blood can go bad and there'll be a high risk for bacterial infection. So once the blood gets to the floor, whoever got picked up the blood for you, you go pick it up. Um, you want to get your baseline vital signs because you want to get them right before you start your transfusion. So you want to get their blood pressure, their heart rate, their temperature, and their respiratory rate. Um, you also need to get another nurse to sign off because even though they checked it down the blood bank, this is such a scary, uh, or not scary, but this is such a high risk procedure that we check it again. And we want two nurses. And this is why, you know, like um, LVNs cannot sign off on blood. Student nurses cannot sign off on blood. This is considered a sentence event if something goes wrong here. So um, two RNs, uh, registered nurses have to, um, you know, um, sign off on this blood. Um, we are going to then also prime our tubing and get ready to transfuse. We can put this, um, the blood in through a pump or to gravity and gravity just means that, um, you know, I just undo the, um, uh, what do you call it, the clamp and like let it flow in without an IV pump. Just depends on, you um, you know, the patient and, um, you know, also your comfort level as well. Once the comfort, uh, once the comfort, once the transfusion has started, you need to stay with the patient for the first 15 minutes and you should check their vital signs after 15 minutes. Of course, if they're starting to show signs of a reaction or some problem before then, you're going to stop and then check it before then. You're not going to wait till the 15 minutes. But what I mean is, is if everything's going well, you're going to stay there for 15 minutes. And then at the end of the 15 minutes, you're going to check their blood pressure, their heart rate, their temperature, their respiratory rate and oxygen levels. 
Um, and th the first 15 minutes are when they're most likely to have a transfusion reaction, which is why there's that 15 minute window. You should still be checking on this patient regularly because there are such things as delayed reactions. Um, so I'm gonna be watching for signs and symptoms of a reaction, which we're gonna talk about on the next slide. Um, and then I'm also assessing for effectiveness and then assessing if there's any problems, how they're tolerating this. Um, as a whole, whether I give it by pump or by gravity, it shouldn't take more than four hours once I hang that blood for it to get into the patient. Um, again, the longer that we have that blood sitting out, the higher chance that it can um, grow bacteria and we do not want the patient to get an infection. So let's talk about some of the reactions that can occur. People get kind of overwhelmed by these, but they're not as scary as they seem. And a lot of them, most of them are very different from one another. So you can usually tell. Um, so with hemolytic, this one happens fast. This is pretty much the body saying, this is not mine. And like, I kind of gave the like, you know, analogy in my class of like, it's like kind of like Star Wars where they get out, uh, what do you call it? And start slashing each other. Um, that's what this is like. Hemolytic um, anemia is kind of like, there's a bunch of lightsabers that, um, that the um, blood cells have. And they're like, I don't like you. You don't look like me. Um, Cause this is someone else's blood that's going in the patient. So they start lightsaber in all of these blood cells. What happens is that all your blood cells start breaking down. So you are literally losing blood cells rapidly. So your blood pressure goes down, you get inflammatory process starts happening. Um, th they start to get congestion because when they get kind of sliced in half with the lightsabers, they really don't, um, they start to cluster and um, clog in areas. So they can complain of back or chest pain. Um, so again, this is a fast reaction that happens within the first 15 minutes, low blood pressure, fever, back pain, chest pain. Um, and it's very, very serious. Of course, with all of these, we're going to stop the transfusion, assess the patient. Um, and after, you know, if I if a patient's having a blood transfusion reaction, I stop the transfusion um, and then I want to flush that line. I'm not going to flush, you know, all more blood into them, but I want to disconnect the blood and then flush that IV because I don't want any blood sitting in that tubing that's going to react more with them. Um, but effectively, I want to try to um, clean that out and then I need to give them some fluids. They're going to have low blood pressure. So that's why I have that extra, um, you know, I usually like to have an extra bag of fluids around if something happens. That way I can just go ahead and infuse, um, you know, give them that extra um, fluid because um, it's going to help support their blood pressure. And it's also going to flush out whatever they're reacting to. It's going to help dilute it. Um, but I want to keep a patent IV because I need to have an IV some way to get medications in them, some way to get um, fluids in them as well. There's also what's known as a febrile reaction. This one's different because the only problem you have is a fever. So if all they're having is a fever, um, this is what we call a febrile reaction. Um, if there's no other symptoms, no other problems, um, we'll have to probably do some tests to rule out other things. But um, you know, usually what can be done in the future is sometimes the body might just be a little sensitive and overreacting. So usually they can still get blood transfusions in the future. We stop this one. Um, but we, um, we, then what we do in the future is maybe give them some acetaminophen or Tylenol before their um, transfusion. Then there's allergic. An allergic can be mild, like itching a rash, or they can be severe and think like anaphylaxis. With both of these, we're going to stop and make sure there's not something more serious going on. Um, and with the mild one in the future, again, some people overreact to things that are not theirs. Um, and so what we might do is give them some, um, uh, you know, some Benadryl or something before to premedicate them the next time they get a transfusion. With the severe, we're going to stop it. They may need um, epinephrine or other treatments. Think of how we treated anaphylaxis. Then there's circulatory overload. This is fluid overload. This is that the patient, maybe they have heart failure, maybe they have some other condition that puts uh, predisposes them to this, but um, effectively there's just too much fluid. Like the blood was just overwhelmed their heart. It was too much. Um, and so um, what we do here is we set their head of bed up. We usually give them diuretics and other medications that are going to help to get that fluid off. Of course, we're going to stop the transfusion um, and, um, you know, try to treat that. We might get a chest x-ray, listen to their lung sounds and be looking for those signs of fluid overload and try to support them in their breathing. There's a sepsis reaction or a septic reaction. So this one's going to look a lot like hemolytic in that there's fever, there's low, bud, low BP, but a lot of times they also have GI symptoms. And the thing, and of course, this is going to take a little while to come back, is that they're going to have like positive blood culture. So sepsis is an infection. This means that the patient got the blood and that either there was bacteria in it for some reason, um, and it causes like a systemic infection in this patient and a systemic inflammatory reaction. 
Um, so a, a good way to, to differentiate sepsis or septic transfusions from hemolytic is that septic, it's not going to be as immediate in that first 15 minutes as hemolytic. It's going to be quick, but it's not going to be in that first 15 minutes. Um, so um, if you start to see these symptoms start to kind of come up um, like, uh, like a little later after the transfusion in the first couple hours, I would be more worried about the sepsis, whereas the hemolytic is going to be in that first 15 minutes. And last but not least, there's also massive transfusion reaction. They um, have a low body temp, they have abnormal heart rhythms, low calcium and low potassium. So checking their, um, uh, their body temperature and then also checking their EKG and their uh, lab, their chemistry is going to really help me with this patient to differentiate this. So if you can get over how, you know, it's sometimes it's kind of hard when there's multiple of these, these are something great to do a flashcard about. Remember, keep it simple, simple and to the point. How do I know a patient have it? What makes it different? Um, and then how am I going to treat it? But keep in mind with all of these, stop the transfusion, um, you know, and then make sure that I have a um, open IV that I can um, infuse fluids through um, to try to dilute whatever the problem is. The only one that I don't want to give fluids, of course, is this circulatory overload because that could definitely uh, um, lead to some problems. So, but um, as a whole, that's, I want to have availability, like even if I'm not going to give um, IV fluids, I want to have an open IV where I can also um, give medications like this patient with circulatory overload. Like I said, they might need some furosemide or a diuretic, but um, as a whole, I just want to be by the patient and be looking for these common symptoms and look at these. Almost all of these have a fever. So I need to watch that temperature really closely. I need to ask the, uh, check their skin out for any sort of allergic reaction. I need to be looking for signs of fluid overload. Um, and then I'm really watching their blood pressure closely too, because it seems like a lot of these reactions, their blood pressure decreases. Um, so yes, so I hope that this was helpful to kind of break down um, blood transfusion and um, administration, and then also blood transfusion reactions. Um, I will see you guys next time.